one. Well, hey, Dave Melinda here, Positive Polarity Podcast. Hope things are going awesome for you this week. I got a great one. I tell you, I'm, I'm I'm even excited about it myself because I really have a statement that is going to cause you to think. It's not a question, but it's a statement. And I want to know if you agree or disagree with this. So I'm going to lay this out for you, and then we're going to un. Uh, unpack it, introduce the guest, and have a great show today. So I want to know, do you agree with this or not? Human, oops, I did See, I screwed this up. That was quick. Work should fuel the human spirit, not drain it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many people that I run into that are drained after a week or their life is just being big to work and there's no real you know, people there. So I like to figure out what this uh, was. So I'm honored to be hanging out with Angie Leon. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you have, for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. So you and here's a new here's a new chief type of you know, we have all these chief operating officers. We have all this. We have a new one. This is a you're considered a chief soul officer, S-O-U-L. And that uh, the company that you uh, are involved with is Black River Performance Management. So fill us in on what Black River Performance Management does. So we basically help the people side of the organization. And, um, and that means that um, we can help them with personal development, professional development, um, tools, leadership competencies, um, just really bridging the gap um, to help people become more effective leaders of themselves and leaders in their organizations, be, you know, creating more self-awareness, understanding ourselves, how we show up, how we're perceived, and just how different each individual is, and just bringing that to light and really starting to help people start to appreciate the differences in styles and behaviors and um, and just appreciate each individual for their unique talents and gifts. And I really sure. do believe that every person has a, a potential that they haven't reached. And everybody's a gem just waiting to be polished. Some people really sure. need a just a soft cloth, you know, to kind of shine them up. I was one that needed more of a jackhammer. But uh, we could get <laughs> to that a little later. <laughs> Sure. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, and I love the fact, Angie, that you, you, you know, it's encouraging to really have um, people think about starting with yourself because it's so easy in today's world to blame your team or your customer, the government, your industry, your competitor, right? There's so many things that we can, you know, um, kind of take the responsibility off of us and put it onto them. So, I like to start, like you said, starting with yourself. So whether it's, you know, um, doing assessments, whether it's self-reflection, there's a variety of ways that you can get to know yourself. But what do you guys use at Black River when it comes to like somebody that comes to you and wants to be developed as a leader? Where, you know, where do you start with that? That's a great question. Well, and first of all, I want to go back to the mindset that you mentioned, because I think that's important to to recognize you're talking about it's easier to blame other people. And and that is not a place where somebody's going to have any growth. If yeah. they're in that victim mindset, they probably won't be seeking out help. <laughs> Every victim needs a villain. And right. And so whenever I hear a lot of that, I, I mean, it doesn't really, I can kind of tell the person's not ready for change, but when I know they're ready for change and they're like, you know what? I think I'm part of the problem. These are my favorite clients. Like I'm, I'm starting to recognize a pattern here yeah. and it's me or um, everywhere I go, there I am. <laughs> it seems right? to be showing up in sure, every sure. <laughs> every little aspect of my life, whether it's in my personal relationships, whether it's in my business relationships, whether it's in my kid relationships with my kids, whatever that yeah. is, generally there's some kind of theme or pattern that's going on in their life and they're sick of their own BS, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And so wow. those are my ideal clients because they're they're like ripe and ready for like a change in their life. They want something. Sure. So when I know that somebody's at that point after talking with them for a little bit and I know they want to change and I've even had people come to me and say, I think I'm kind of passive aggressive and I'd like to not be passive aggressive. Sure. And I'm just like, this is awesome. Like we can just get to the root and figure out what this is about. So yeah. uh, we use a variety of tools and you some of those same ones you use, TTI. Yep. Um, yep. My favorite that I, that I use the most is Try EQ that has okay. uh, disc driving forces and and the emotional intelligence. That's the yeah. one I would say I use the most. I mean, I love all of them, but that one sure. I really feel like gives a really good basis for how you show up. Well, I love yeah. it. First of all, it gives you a language. Mm -hmm. So in cultures built to have a language or to have a culture, we all need to yeah. speak this language. So it's part right. of that foundation for building culture. So um, we look at, uh, we're all speaking the same language. We understand different styles, ways of communicating, ways of seeing, or lenses we see the world through, kind of. Yeah, and sure. then drivers, are they're, they're a little more under the surface and kind of our preferences to what's going to fuel us and what's going, you know, we said work should fuel the human spirit. So like what fuels you and what kind of sucks the life out of you, kind of getting yeah. to know those things. And then how our emotions show, handle, or our emotions impact those things um couldn't be really good or it could be really you know it could be harmful to us if we don't work on the emotional uh, intelligence skills and understand ourself and uh, understand others and our relationship management so i think that's probably the most comprehensive tool that somebody could use for a couple of years to really work sure. on them um and so i was introduced to it mm -hmm. 2016, 2017, um, through Ron Price. Um, I went through his uh, leadership program uh, okay. called Complete Leader, and it really changed the trajectory of my life. Um, I was kind of, at that time, I was in a, a role um, teaching in higher ed, and I start, and I was kind of not, there was a few things that I wasn't liking about my job, and I couldn't really figure out why. Um, but when I went through that and I used the tools, I learned so much about myself. And I also saw some things that I didn't like too, right? Yep. <laughs> and that really, that's feedback right on the paper, sure. right? Yep. And of course, of course, your brain goes to the negative, the thing that you don't like. It's not looking right. at 500 things that it says that you are amazing yeah. at. Your brain goes directly to what? I talk too much or... Right. <laughs> yep. No kidding. Well, and that's so true. Yeah. I'm no, unorganized. That's... What? <laughs> yep, right? Not me. No. But I think, I mean, and thanks for sharing that. There's so much there that you just unpacked. And I think I, I wrote down like victims don't grow. And I think that that's a really important thing to think about. As again, we pointed out before, if you're generally the type of person that will blame others first, I like when someone says, you know, Part of the problem is me, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's in a marriage or it's in a relationship with another individual or it's a work thing, you know, mm -hmm. rarely is it 100 percent one person and zero the other. Right. And and we find that um, especially on the emotional intelligence side, like you're talking about. So um, I think that um, using an, an assessment tool is so helpful because. If we, you know, like if I just asked you a question and you weren't familiar with any of this and I, I was like, Angie, what motivates you? I mean, that's like a hard question to, you know, really understand or to, to answer in, a, in an intelligent way because we generally aren't thinking in those terms. Yeah. Like we started with, we're just in that, you know, spot where we're working every day, we show up every day and it kind of drains us. It doesn't really fuel us. So, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, how did you start in that? I, I'm interested to hear because you, when you were in higher ed, you know, you were working for a school system or a college or some type of organization. What led you to get out of that and, and into this um, personal development space? So I think that's a good question. So I, at the time I was going back to school because I was teaching surgical technology, which is, it's the person who helps the surgeon 
perform the surgery. The one that hands the instruments anticipates okay. what is the surgeon. So they're scrubbed in. So I was teaching that. And through that process, I went back to school to get my um, bachelor's in um, workplace training and leadership. And so as I was doing that, I was learning all about you know, emotional intelligence, I was learning leadership skills, you know, all that types of stuff. And I found it mm -hmm. really fascinating. I've sure. always been, yeah, I've always been a helper and a fixer and a kind of, I was in healthcare because I like fixing people's problems, whether it was their knee or their hip or their, you know, just, yeah. I was really hands-on, right? And then I started teaching that and going through the process of going back to school, actually, I got really fascinated with human behavior um, because I'd been watching people in the operating room for years. And what I know from being raised in a traumatic environment is that my social awareness is really good. Like mm. laser, like super laser focused. I, it's kind of like a superpower. Yeah. I'm, I'm very aware of other people. I wasn't okay. as aware, but I was super socially aware. That's it. It served me well growing up. Sure. So, um, Anyways, I had um, this power to kind of look at people and recognize that they are very smart, but some of them had no idea how their behaviors were impacting their team or how they, they weren't socially aware. And some of them were really good. And when the team, when that surgeon or that leader, um, which is usually is the surgeon in the room, was really highly emotional, intelligent, and treated their staff really well and asked for what they need, but weren't mean, weren't throwing instruments, weren't, you know, telling them they're incompetent, loser, and they never want to see them in their room again. You know, these real sure. things that happen. Um, yeah, so when I would see a really orchestrated team that worked really well, it was such a beautiful experience. And you're sure. just, there's nothing like it. It's just like an orchestra, right? But then when I would see some of these other ones, I'm like, this actually puts your patient at risk. And these egos that are, you know, flying and all the stuff and it all rolls downhill. So if the surgeon acts like that, then the nurse takes it out on the next person. And there's all sure. this lateral violence and and it's toxic and nobody wants to be there and people are fearful. They don't want to speak up. There's no psychological safety. So I just started to see all of that. And okay. I didn't know how I could help in the operating room and I, there it's a deep culture. It's a, it, you know, and it's kind of a different space anyways, because it's kind of like the Vegas of the hospital, like the patients are asleep and nobody goes in there. So you don't really, you don't really know what happens. Right. Sure. Sure. And um, so when, uh, the more I started studying, I learned that a lot of people didn't have those emotional intelligence skills, including myself including yeah. myself. I had the social awareness, but I wasn't very self-aware um, about what was going on in me, but I knew what sure. was going on around me. Sure. Yeah. That's crazy. So then you end up falling in love, so to speak, with the coaching, training, consulting side. Mm -hmm. And because we have a lot of people listening right now, Angie, that are on that spot where they're still in corporate America and they're trying to find ways to get out of it or corporate world because there's people all over the world listening. But it's interesting because I always tell people there's no right or wrong way to do it. Some people, they quit their job one day. I had a guest on that six days after he was married. He came home and said, honey, I quit my job. She had no clues. I mean, it was like not a positive way to do it. So I say, hey, don't listen, you know, just use our examples as potential ideas. Don't follow what anybody says. Um, word for word for you though was it a kind of a slow thing for you where it just gradually happened or did you just be like I'm out of here I got to do something else and and you followed your passion okay that's a good question so it had a couple of things couple of things going on at once when I was going through the using the tools and it was um, it was the emotional intelligence the disc and all that and I I started to learn that I'm actually a promoter I am not okay. and I was I had been holding coordinator roles okay so there was wow. a lot of data and steps. yeah so even though I was really good at some aspects of my job like 
making relationships, getting new surge, getting new hospital clinical sites, getting donations, um, all those things I was really good at. Parts yeah. of my job that I really didn't like was managing like how many surgical cases did this student do and in what specialty, sure. how many first scrubs did they have and blah, 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 blah. I, I got a system to do it. And that the good news is I, I had people to mentor me and to help me with a system. But if I would have had to do that on my own, I know that would, I, I don't think I would have thrived in that role. So, but I didn't know the, all of that. Yeah. And why there was so, so many things, tasks in the job that I just didn't like that much. The data, yeah. the collection of the data to make them graduate and all sure. that. Right? Yep. So, so did it did it end up where you once you've identified that then was it a short was it then like oh my gosh I'm gone or did it still take some time for you to transition It took some time because I actually loved the job and I loved the students and then I also had um a boyfriend at the time who is, ends up becoming my husband and so then I had then I ended up moving from Boise Idaho to um southeast Idaho and so when I moved over, I still went to um, the surgical route. I did a little bit of medical sales for a little bit. I was okay. good at that, but didn't like the high stress and driving all over the place. And sure, um, sure. yeah, and so I did that for a while. And then I went, well, maybe I'll go back to higher ed for a little bit. And then I got in another role, just taking jobs that weren't a good fit because I needed an income. And then yeah. I was like, okay, this is I need to use what I know and just do what I'm good at. So I ended up working um, at, in higher ed for a while. And then I start, we started, after I got over here, we started our business and I started doing lunch and learns with people. I knew I got certified in emotional intelligence. That was the first thing I did um, as soon as I graduated, because I knew that that was something that I, this whole thing changed my life. And I was like, I need to be certified in this and I want to help other people because I've overcome so much from just learning this language and understanding myself and knowing why my family acted the way they did and why so many people show up the way they do. And I really do believe that people are doing the best they can, um, yeah. but uh, often they don't have the tools or the mindset or the language to express themselves or, and I, and so I was like, this is what I want to do, but I didn't know how I would make the income I made it not that it's a huge income when you're working in higher ed but it's at least steady and safe sure yep yep <laughs> so so there I was like go. yeah is if I could just make enough to like make ends meet and make what I make in higher ed that's all I want so I started doing a lot of lunch and learns I did a lot of talks and um you know some little workshops until you know finally it just it, it took a, a few years and then it just I kind of became the emotional intelligence guru on this side of the of our state and sure. then and I did disc and all that stuff too but I emotional intelligence is the one that I, if I had a magic wand yeah then I would give it to everybody <laughs> which one so here's a total sidebar question because I'm just curious which of the five uh components of EQ do you feel like is the most important if you had to rank them self-awareness yeah that's generally what people say right because there's self-awareness social awareness self-regulation social mm -hmm. regulation and then the motivation piece so and, and I think that's so important um as we head into break here I just want to ask you this question and then we'll jump back into another topic but from an EQ perspective we're hearing about it out there we're hearing about emotional intelligence you know it doesn't seem to be as um you know, at least in the Midwest, I'm in the Midwest right now. So um, it doesn't feel like it's as um, is gaining traction as much as it should, as much as DISC is. Are you seeing that in, in, in Idaho and in parts of the country that you travel in? Or what's your experience been with the EQ part? Um, I think since COVID, it's it, ours has boosted because people okay. have seen a lot of emotional um reactions in the workplace and to uncertain times and stress and all of this so and i think they're starting to see the research that you know 
people with higher EQ do better. Um, they 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 have they are better employees. They perform higher. They, yeah. you know, they're better to be around. They're better leaders. So like the research is in, and so I think it's I think it's gaining traction now. But I think there's a lot of lies about emotional intelligence or what or or not lies, but really, well, they're kind of lies and they're just like assumptions, really, about sure. what it is like means I have to be nice to everybody or means I have to, you know, we're going to be all singing Kumbaya and crying at work and stuff like that. Yeah. And so I think it's a lot of that, but really sure. what it is, understanding yourself, having a language. Yeah getting to know and understanding others and meeting them where they are and, and having some empathy, even if it's not your experience. Yeah. And I, and I think that, that, again, as you talk about knowing yourself, I think that's so important. So when we come back from break, Angie, I want to talk about the fueling the human spirit, not draining it, because that does start with some people just think that I, I had a, I had a guy that I talked to and he's like, I'm like, how's work? He's like, I hate it. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, everybody hates their job. I'm just like, wow, where where did that come from? What lie did you, you know, buy into to just uh, make such a broad assumption? Now, if you want to believe that you you hate your job and you're always going to, that's up to you. But please don't don't put that on me because I I'm not in that camp. So uh, we're gonna take a break and we come back. I want to unpack that with you. Sounds great. Welcome back. I'm honored to be hanging out with Angie Leon, the Chief Soul Officer and Owner of Black River Performance Management in Idaho. So thank you again for hanging out today, Angie. And the wording on your website was so like in my face when it said work should fuel the human spirit, not drain it. And so for people that are listening right now that maybe they've never thought of it this way, they were maybe taught that work is always going to drain you. Work is always going to be labor. That's why they call it work. Um, you know, whatever their kind of misconception is that they're coming from, how do you help them look at this from a different perspective um, to where hopefully by the end of this podcast today, there's at least, um, you know, two people around the world that now think of their work as fuel rather than as a drain. How do you introduce this topic? Okay, that's a good one. I I would just say, think about things in a mindset. We all have a growth mindset in certain things of our life, and we all have a fixed mindset in certain areas of our life. So that to me, if somebody were to say to me that we're all, what work is going to suck and it's always going to be like that, that would be a mindset. And that would be a fixed mindset. So uh, th like that would be something that I wouldn't probably be able to help unless I could get them over their own mindset and recognizing that some people do. Like for me, I love my job. Now I've done jobs that I didn't love, but there was certain things in the job that I could focus on that I loved. And even certain people that I really look forward to seeing at work. At, you know, what could I find that sure. I like in the role, because it, if I'm looking for everything I hate, I'm going to find more of everything I hate. I'm going to find more confirmation bias, right? So I will find yeah. out, find more of what I don't like. So I would actually start with the person and just find, start to find out what do you love? Appreciative inquiry and find out what do, what is working well? What do I like? And I would tap into that a little bit and ask them, you know, what's going really well for you? And, um, and what are, and then, I, and then we'd look at the obstacles or the things that they don't like doing and you know, why did you sign up for this job in the first place? And yeah. are there any other options? Are there, you know, what other things have you explored? But really, um, when we use assessments, like, like our tri DNA, our tri DNA, our tri EQ, I really feel like sometimes it can just sh quickly show what their strengths are and what would be a really good opportunity for them that might fuel them. And, and, Oftentimes people can't articulate this stuff. It's a right. lot. And that yeah. report puts out 60 some, 70 some pages. You know, right. You know, right. Yeah. And so when they see it, it's like, oh my goodness. I'm like, use this language to understand yourself and to understand what you're good at and to understand yeah. what you bring to the team, the value you bring to the organization and to your family. One thing I also love is that these tools are not just for the workplace. 
Right. We use them with ourselves and in our own marriages and with our kids and with our own team and our virtual assistants and anybody that is interacting with us, we are our first customers. So if we're doing better and our relationships are thriving, we're going to do better in the workplace. So I would also recognize that we have a home life and a work life. And if one of those isn't going well, it's going to flow into the other one. Yeah. And so what I love about the tools is they're not just for work. They could, you could be doing great at work, but it could help you with your marriage and then your work life even better. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, it's just crazy when I hear people say, you know, leave your work life or leave your home life in the car, you know, don't bring your problems into the office. And it's like, you know what, if we could compartmentalize that good and where we could literally leave that problem in the car and it didn't have any effect on our day, that's what I think is so powerful. One of the tools in the EQ is asking a question, are you clear right now? Are you a little red or are you really red? You know, are you thinking clearly or not? I think those, you know, thinking in those um, terms goes back to that self-awareness piece. And why are so many people not aware? They just kind of go through their day without that awareness. I just don't know if you've seen any like reasons why that is. I don't know if it's boredom or lack of knowledge or just don't care. But what have you seen when somebody comes up to you and says, I don't really care about that? I mean, where's that coming from? Do you, do you have any feel for where that's coming from? I have a feeling it's fear. And it, what I have seen um, is some people don't really want to look in the mirror and they don't want to see themselves. It's really too painful. Um, maybe they've, maybe there's someone, and, and I can relate to that because it was painful for me, especially I was somebody with eight out of 10 adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And so like I getting any kind of feedback was hard and difficult for me earlier on. Um, and so I, I, I empathize with them. And I also recognize that it's, I think one of the hardest things that we ever do is be accountable for ourselves, be compassionate for ourselves, look at ourselves in the mirror. And some people aren't ready for that. And some people I don't think ever will be, they will just never really evolve. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just, so I really think that they're at this place where, you know, their life isn't where they want it to be, but they're not ready to take accountability for it. And the research actually shows that only 15% of people across all industries are self-aware. This is Tashi Yurik's uh, work. And they, you know, she rated everybody, including higher ed, uh, you know, and the people that were self-aware were so rare that she called them self-awareness unicorns because they did 360 degree surveys to find out, are they as self-aware as they think they are? Sure, right? yep. Because yep. if you think you're self-aware, that doesn't mean you are. You have to <laughs> get feedback, right? Are you, yep. if you're the leader, what does your team think, right? Yep. Yep. No, and that's a, that brings up a great point. Uh, my next book I'm working on is on business blind spots. And I think like what you just said is a big blind spot for people where they think they're emotionally aware, they think they're emotionally intelligent, whatever the words are, um, mm -hmm. you know, they think they're at a spot and they, but they don't really have that accountability, like you said, and they're afraid to do it. And I always tell people, find a good friend or, you know, find a coworker you trust, find a peer to peer group, find a coach, find a consultant, find somebody that's going to be able to help you. Because we talk about Tiger Woods swing all the time. That guy's got one of the prettiest golf swings I've ever seen. But I tell you what, you know what, you, a golf uh, coach looks at him and he goes, Oh, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. And he's like, what? I had no clue, you know, and you do these little course corrections and major improvements happen. Yeah. And I think that I, I, I feel like one of the big blind spots that people have about personal development is like, I'm, I'm, they're going to make me do this 180 degree shift. Right. And a lot of times, and I'm curious on your view on this, they feel like there's small course corrections that go on along the way. And I was just curious from your experience at the personal development side, is that what you're seeing big big changes or are they smaller course corrections generally? 
I like working with my clients for a longer period of time with short, little micro lessons and so that they can implement it. Sure. Because I don't think a training is very helpful. It's good to know the language and learn a little bit, but it's yeah. if that's all you do is check a box. We had emotional intelligence training. Right. It's not, it's not going to be transformational. Um, yeah. Transformation happens over time and it's a process. And I've been studying it since 2016 and I still don't know this, all the stuff. And there's sure. so much research coming out all the time. I find that the more I learn and I am high intellectual and I love learning, <laughs> but the more I learn, the more I know I don't know. And so yeah. I think some people think they already have it figured out too. They just right. have a fixed that is like I, I'm good I'm, I don't need nope. to, I don't need any help and it's like well I wonder if that's what your family thinks or I wonder if that's what the people that work with you yep. think well I would let's ask, ask. <laughs> let, so, let, so are you ready to do a 360 degree survey and let's let's see if yeah. you're right <laughs> but yep, that exactly. is, that requires some bravery and that requires yep. some humility and that yep. requires a willingness and an openness to to say hey I have room for improvement and I think some people are still living in ego so much that they can't see that it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. We've all come up short or don't, you know, it's it's not like you're looking for perfection. You're looking for progress over perfection. Yeah, for sure. And we run into people, and I'm sure you do as well, Angie, that they 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 want to take the disc assessment just to kind of cross it off their bucket list or their list and then you know they hold they three hole punch it put it in a binder and then they stick it up on the shelf right and they're like who got that done right so i think that's like the educate part and then there's like the motivate part where it kind of might motivate them you know in a little bit of way but it tends to be short lived that's what I like when you said transform, because, you know, that transformation, that's a that's a lifelong thing, but it's also generally a permanent thing as well. Um, do you find people kind of stop? They they like that. They they take the assessment and then they put it up on the shelf and then they kind of go back to their norm. Do you run into people that do that as well? I run into organizations that do that. And I, it's not my favorite people to work with because I really do want them to see how the tools work. And I I'm upfront about it and just say, you know, these tools will work as much as you work them. It's like right. owning, it's like owning gardening tools. The garden doesn't weed itself. Exactly. <laughs> yep. No, absolutely. Right. Wouldn't I it be nice know. if it did? Yes. Hey, I bought a cordless screw gun and the thing just sits there and not, not one screw ever gets, you know, removed or, or added. So yeah. I think that that's that's really powerful. Um, it's skill you got to build, so you can't just do it. It's skill building. So any skill, like you talked about, golf swing, yeah. even if it's golf swing, emotional intelligence are skills, and they right. are absolutely something that we could put into practice every day. And a coach or a mentor or a peer, um, somebody that's in it with you, and you're willing to be vulnerable and say, "Oh boy, man, I messed that up. Um, my daughter yeah. said this, and I freaked out, or whatever." Uh, I want to now I know what my trigger is and I want to actually do better because my trigger and my emotions are my responsibility. So I yeah. want to take accountability for those and I want to respond in a better way or I want to wait until I can have a better reaction. Um, and because my relationships are too important for for me to mess them up. Sure, sure. Beyond, beyond you know, repair. Yeah. If somebody does have a growth mindset and they're listening right now and they are in that spot where they do feel that they're not getting fueled, but they are getting drained, mm -hmm. um, do you have any simple like thoughts for them or encouragement or tools? What, how would you instruct that person to kind of, you know, move more towards their growth? Again, you talked about like, look at some of the things that you like about your job. But what if there's like a small amount of things that you like, and then this huge list of things that you don't like? I mean, how, how do you like counsel that individual at that spot? I would ask them what some of their other options are too. Like, is there, uh, is this company that you're working for, are there other positions that might be a better fit? So if we use the assessment, I would usually be able to find out what it is that really is draining them. Or is there an available, is there any 
flexibility in that job to um, work with somebody, work with your boss to find out if, let's say for me, in my experience, when I was doing a bunch of data entry or creating a database and tracking stuff, that is, it drained me. I did not like it, yeah. but I could find somebody at work that was good at that. Yeah. Um, and I would ask for help. So yeah. I would ask them, it's okay. What I find is a lot of people are afraid to say they don't know everything, but I would guarantee in their job description, but I sure. guarantee, I guarantee, let's say you have 20 things on your job description, 20 tasks. Yeah. I bet you at about eight or 10 of them. I bet yeah. you're like on point and knocking them out of the park, but there's sure. probably a good 10 or 12 that you don't like, you don't do them very often or they're annual tasks. So they're like the big frog that you just, Ooh, you just don't want to eat it. Yeah. And, and so I would say, what are those one, those tasks and who is good on your team at those things? Yeah. Yeah. And I bet you they would absolutely help you on that task. For me, budgeting was one of those things that I didn't enjoy. And it was one year or it was once a year. So yeah. I never got good at it. But I knew yeah. there were people that it was like their thing, budgeting or creating databases. So I would counsel them to find somebody that is good at organization or, or whatever they're, they're not good at. Sure. And and find somebody to help them and ask for help. That's also one thing yeah. I see that people are afraid to do is admit that they don't have it all or they want to they want to make people proud. I think they want to make their boss proud. They want to make themselves proud. And it's sometimes um, they don't you don't know what their background is or what you know what they've dealt with with bosses before. But sometimes they're just afraid to even say, I don't really know how to do this. I'm just kind of faking it. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> It's hard to find people that are vulnerable today, Angie, because it's just, it's presented as such a weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember my dad would tell me stuff like, don't let them see a sweat and rub some dirt on it, you know, all these things growing up. And it's just like, man, you know, you don't know what to think as a kid growing up in that kind of environment. I, my dad was awesome. So all the positive far outweighed the few negatives that he had, but vulnerability for him early on was not one that was like taught to me. So yeah. then I had to kind of learn it from my mom and, you know, so it's hard. Vulnerability is not a taught thing, but yet it's something that is really becoming like such an asset when you're able to do that, especially if you're a leader and you're expecting your team to be vulnerable and, you know, do as I say, not as I do type thing. You know, yeah. and it's like, man, you guys, this is just crazy. So I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, one of our tenants is that vulnerability is not does not equal weakness. And we really do. Talk. How do you actually have a, any kind of meaningful relationship? How do you build trust without vulnerability? Yeah. How do you build any relationship without some right. vulnerability? Which all the C people listening right now, all the engineers are just like, that's like, you know, fingers on the chalkboard to them because, you know, those are, they're not emotional people, they're fact people. So I get that it's yeah. going to be easier for some than others. Mm -hmm. um, when you run into like a high C engineer type person and you're talking about vulnerability, how do you put it in words that they're going to understand uh, to be more open to that vulnerability piece? Well, I talk to them about, do they want the relationship? Do they want yeah. to be productive? Do they want to, do they want to have a collaborative team? Do they want to get more done? Like yeah. we can't do everything ourselves. And if we don't have relationships with the people we work with or live with, if they're not healthy, we're going to, we're going to be stuck. And so we need other people in our lives even if we're introverts we still need human connection and we need to get things accomplished and yeah. uh, and the relationships are the most important part to any business um, if the relationships and the communication are working well then we can get so much more done and um, get out of our own way to be to accomplish such great things and I am married to a high C he ha he has high emotional intelligence and he he knows that I you know, he, I'm more emotional, but he, he has had to develop those skills and yeah. as well, um, his eye has had to come up quite a bit to be a presenter, yeah. a teacher, so he can adapt when he needs to. It's just not, he has to try harder at it is all sure. it is. He just yeah. has to put in more effort in yeah. that area. 
just like I have to put in more effort to create a spreadsheet or a database, I no. it would take a lot more energy. So no. he can't do it all the time, but he key relationships and people he's trying to work with, he knows it's important. Yeah, well, and I think that the, as we land the plane today, I think that that's a really good concept to think about why people don't want to embark on this is exactly what you just said. It takes work. And, you know, it's so much easier to just be sloppy in your communication, to mm -hmm. um, communicate in your language and not worry about the language of the person that's, you know, you're talking to. It's just easier to to not worry about that. And mm -hmm. I'm not here to say it's right or wrong. I just know that if you do think about the other person, like you said, higher EQ people, they make more money. They are higher up in positions. They have more fulfillment in their life. There's just not really any downside to this other than it takes work. So yeah. uh, probably the lazy people right now haven't even got to this part of the podcast because they probably just flipped it off anyway. Um, but I, I just feel like there's just some things we have to do as human beings. And part of it is just consider the person that you're communicating with. And, and that's what I, I just I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think that, you know, it does take work and that's anything worth having takes work. And I really do believe, and this is why I'm doing this now is because it has transformed my me, it's transformed my relationships, it's transformed, I mean, I've coached people straight out of incarceration, students to executives, county commissioners, like I have coached Supreme Court judges, like I have this little girl from North Idaho has transformed her life and awesome. is helping other people transform theirs through understanding themselves, understanding um, how they show up. And these are the hard skills. I hate the term soft skills. They're, mm. they're the hard, they're hardest yeah. because they take the most, they take work. We all can sure. learn how to do our job tasks. They're not that difficult. We can learn right. by budget. We can learn to well, well, emotional intelligence skills takes intention, and so does learning how to communicate and communicate more effectively. So it's it's not a you don't get a certificate or a graduation diploma from this. It's no. it is a lifelong process, right. and I would say you have the ability to improve until you take your last breath. Yeah. And that's hard for a high D like me because I'm results oriented. I want there to be an end. So I want to see the end of the internet. I want to see the end of emotional intelligence. I want to graduate so I don't have to keep doing that. But like you said, that's not something that that's not how it works. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, one last question, Angie, I'm going to let you go. Um, what would your tip of the day be for somebody listening? Maybe it's something that we covered uh, maybe it's something that's just on your heart that you haven't had a chance to share yet, but what would be your tip of the day? I would say that my tip would be to look at people through a lens of they're actually doing the best they can right now with the tools, the mindset, and the resources that, that they have. They would do better if they knew better. And what would, how would that change your life? If, if, you, if you just think about somebody that you're struggling with right now, yeah. that, that is difficult, difficult to work with, difficult to be around. What if you looked at them through a lens of compassion that they're doing the best they can? Yeah. They, wow. they obviously don't have the tools, the language or the, or the skill set to do any better, or yeah. they would better because I can tell you that most people don't wake up and say I want to go to work and be a complete pain and ruin people's lives and make yep. them miserable nobody thinks they're that person yep that's awesome we th I say that all the time I'm like do you really think that this you know, we do conflict resolution training and I'm like do you really think that this person you're in conflict with right now drove to work today and was like man I can't wait to find a way to be mean to Angie I'm going to berate her. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Yeah, there are certain people in this world probably that are, but the vast majority of people are not doing that. So that's awesome. I love that piece of being empathetic to other people. I, I mean, just give them a, I always say, just give them a get out of jail free card today. Mm -hmm. You know, just give sure. them one, just, you know, try it and see what happens, you know? 
Yeah, and I always tell people too that the people that sometimes are the crunchiest in the workplace generally need the most love. And yeah. you know, hurt people hurt people. And there's they probably have a lot of pain and some suffering going on under the surface, and all you see is the behaviors on top. And anger is one that is easier, or the cool or the tough emotion. So you might see a lot of that, but it it could, it most likely has to do with some fear, some jealousy. Sure some resentment, some insecurity, some loneliness. Those are actually some of the emotions that are probably going on underneath the surface. But all you see is crunchy, grouchy, yeah. you know, or a Karen or whatever people say, right? You know, so yeah. they see the behaviors. They don't know what's going on underneath. And I would say to look at people and just know that most people have a story that would bring you to your knees if yeah. you knew what was really going on. Yeah, they. I remember the story somebody told me about uh, uh, a man in a subway, and he had two kids in the subway, and they were in the car and in the subway train, and um, he wasn't paying any attention to them, and they were just kind of, you know, running around being kids, mischievous, not listening, and this and that. And finally, somebody came up to the guy and was like, "Can you put, you know, can you calm your kids down?" And the guy said, hey, I'm really sorry. We just left the hospital. My wife just passed away and I just don't know where to go or what to do. So it's exactly like what you said. You know what? We don't know the backstory of this. Mm -hmm. You know, for you to say that eight out of 10 traumatic things happened in your life. I'm like, I don't even know them. I don't even know what that means. And if I would have been less than graceful or if I would have came down on you for something you, I mean, that could just go in such a bad way. So I, I so appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing all this today with us, Angie. Um, if somebody is listening now and they want to, you know, this has kind of sparked some interest in them. They want to learn more about the fueling the human spirit, not draining it. What was, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Thank you. Um, they can go to our website and they can see, learn more at uh, www.blackriverp, as in performance, and m as in management.com. So blackriverpm.com. They could email me at angie at blackriverpm.com. And I'm happy to offer uh, a 30 minute consultation if there's somebody that's interested in learning more um, about oh, that's awesome. you know, about yeah. improving themselves. That's awesome. I want somebody, you know what, I just, our goal every week is just to expose people to ideas. You know, this might not work for you. That's fine. But I'm guessing right now, there's one of you listening, at least one of you that this is really like affecting you because you look back at your life and go, oh my gosh, I have been drained for years. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, here's a great time now 30 minute free opportunity to just learn a little bit about how you can turn that draining into actual fuel for you. I mean, and, and as Angie said, your family's going to appreciate it, your customers are going to appreciate it, you're going to appreciate it the company, everybody around you is going to appreciate that. So please take her up on that. Thank you so much for hanging out um, with me today, Angie. And I can't wait to keep learning more from you and from your husband, even though he's a high C, we'll, we'll give him a get out of jail free card. But uh, thanks for thanks for all you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate being here. And thank you for, you know, just putting this good goodness into the world. And, and as a free resource to people, it's, Amazing.